a group of 14 couples and two men whose partners had died. Mr. Obergefell was a man who had a very deep relationship with his partner, whose partner became very ill, was diagnosed with ALS, and as he was dying, they decided that they wanted to be certain to be bound forever, and because they couldn't get married in the state where they lived, they uh, hired an airplane, a special medical aircraft plane to fly to a state that allowed the marriage. They had to get married in the airplane because Mr. Obergefell's partner was too ill to get out. And then they flew back. And when this man died, the state refused to list Mr. Obergefell as his surviving spouse on the death certificate. And similarly, a case of two women, um, de Bear and Rouse, who were both nurses in a long-standing committed relationship with three children, one of whom was a child who was born prematurely and uh, was so severely handicapped that the mother, the biological mother of the child abandoned the child in the hospital. This couple took them home, and then they subsequently adopted yet another special needs child. But they too lived in a state that did not recognize same-sex marriage. And as a result, only one of the women was allowed to be a legal parent of these children, which meant that if one of them died, the other one would have no legal relationship with these three extremely delicate children. And as a result, a series of cases were filed challenging state laws prohibiting same-sex marriages. And this is the case we're going to talk about today. Just to give you an idea, this is essentially what the um, landscape of the United States looked like before this decision. The gray states are states where same-sex marriage was recognized. And the other, the ones in color, either prohibited it outright or made it extremely difficult. But essentially, these were states that had bans on uh, same-sex marriages. The legal landscape, this is obviously an extremely abbreviated and <coughs> streamlined timeline. But in 1971, the first case uh, challenging laws that did not allow same-sex marriage as being unconstitutional went up to the United States Supreme Court. And in 1971, the United States Supreme Court said that there was no federal question, and they dismissed the case. That is to say, there was no issue, no constitutional issue presented by the situation. In 1996, the federal government adopted the Defense of Marriage Act which defined marriage as a legal union between one man and one woman. And as a background to all of this, there was great political, social, uh, and legal debate as to the status of these issues. It wasn't until 2013, that is two, two years ago, that the Defense of Marriage Act was, or at least the section of the Defense of Marriage Act that defined marriage as being between a man and a woman, was held to be unconstitutional. That's the background beyond which, behind which, uh, or rather before which, this case was, uh, was posed. And this is the case, Obergefell versus Hodges, decided essentially a year ago that finally held that right that the right to marry is a fundamental constitutional right protected by the Constitution. And in particular, it meant that any couple, be they same sex or opposite sex, requesting a marriage license and meeting the appropriate uh, requirements had a right to this marriage license. And that any same sex marriage performed in a place that was legal when the marriage was performed, had to immediately be recognized in every state in the United States, which essentially meant 
retroactive reinstatement of rights flowing from marriage in any state that previously had not recognized these unions. The rationale for this holding, this is of course a gross oversimplification, but essentially was based on these four reasons. First, that the right to personal choice regarding marriage is inherent in the concept of individual autonomy, that is part of personal liberty and therefore belong to every individual in the United States. That the right to marry is fundamental because it supports a two-person union unlike any other in its importance to the committed individuals. This specifically addressed the situation of many states that had adopted something similar to marriage for same-sex couples, either civil unions or registered partnerships, etc. But this case finally recognized that um, <coughs> Any of these pseudo marriages didn't represent the same thing as a marriage in the traditional sense. That point three, the right to marry safeguards children and families, thus draws meaning from related rights of child rearing, procreation, and education. This, of course, at least in my opinion, the weakest of the three argument uh, of the four arguments, since this was traditionally an argument that was used to oppose same-sex marriages on the grounds that same-sex marriages cannot procreate, that you need one of each gender to reproduce. That said, the Supreme Court turned that argument on its ear and decided that this was one of the reasons why the right to marry had to be extended to families with two same-sex parents. And the fourth was that the court's cases and nation's traditions make clear that marriage is a keystone of our social order. That is, the recognition that goes with the traditional concept of marriage is something so important in the social order that to deprive same-sex couples of it violates the same-sex couple's rights. This has numerous consequences. Obviously, for the first time now, those states that previously did not recognize same-sex unions now have to give all of the qualifications that flow from marital status. Preferences, for example, when one of the members of a couple dies, that there is a preference that the other person be the appropriate person to administer their estate and their succession. Or states that recognize the notion of community property, which essentially says that if either or both of the members of a couple acquire property during the marriage, that property automatically belongs to both. And that each has an undivided half ownership in each piece of property, each asset that the couple acquires. This is something that previously was not possible in same-sex marriages. Parental rights as well, the ability to adopt the other spouse's child, particularly the ability for both parents to adopt a child which neither one has a biological relationship with. Uh, the ability to make medical decisions on behalf of the children. This was particularly a problem with the two nurses who adopted these very sick children. Um, and also the right to obtain information from schools, for example, concerning their children. In addition, all spousal benefits, be they health insurance, retirement benefits, family leave, child care, all of these things immediately flow from this uh, decision as soon as the marital relationship is recognized. Same thing for succession law. Uh, the notion all of the um, intestate succession laws will now apply and cover same-sex spouses who choose to marry. Uh, I think I'll get back for the moment. This was a decision, however, that was reached by a 5-4 decision. That is, five justices voted for it and four against. And the dissents were, to say the least, virulent. And from a strict legal standpoint, quite possibly much stronger legal reasoning than the arguments made by the majority. Uh, in the United States system, as I'm sure all of you know, it's a federation. 
most rights belong to the states unless the Constitution specifically gives those rights to the federal legislation. And everything having to do with family law essentially belongs to the states. So Chief Justice Roberts said that by that essentially the United States Supreme Court had usurped the power of the state governments by attempting to define marriage for every state, that this was a role that belonged to the voters of every state. Justice Scalia went even farther and said that this case represents a threat to democracy because once again we have the United States Supreme Court usurping what should be legislative power. Justice Alito argued that this is the creation of a new right that never existed before and that new rights should only be created by the Constitution itself. So if a new right was to be created, what that meant was the Constitution should have been amended. And Justice Thomas raised, well, a number of points, but perhaps his argument is, is one of the more interesting ones in that he says that the notion of liberty, as we've seen it throughout cases in the past, essentially means that the US Constitution and the liberties that are guaranteed by the Constitution are liberties to be free from government intervention in an area that belongs to the individual. That historically, that's what the Bill of Rights of the Constitution does. It protects citizens from government violating your home for illegal searches and seizures. It prevents the government from censuring speech. It prevents the government from uh, interfering in the private domain. But that in this case, we don't have a situation where the government is interfering with rights that exist. Here, we have a situation where, because of the court's decisions, a new right has been created, and from that right flow a whole series of government benefits, etc. And that this is not liberty, because liberty means protect people from intervention, interference by the government. And here, we have the court not protecting, but rather creating some new right that didn't exist before. And Thomas points out as well that this may interfere with a right that very clearly is granted by the Constitution, and that is the freedom of religion. The freedom of religion not only is clearly in the Constitution, it's spelled out in the First Amendment. You may wonder why I say that, but here are some examples. If uh, same-sex couples must be treated the same way that uh, opposite-sex couples are treated, and if a member of the government whose job it is to issue marriage licenses, for example, as part of his or her religious beliefs, cannot accept same-sex marriage, and cannot be involved in a same-sex marriage or they'll go to hell for being eternally damned, can the US government force that person to issue a marriage license in violation of that person's religious beliefs? Well, clearly that's what this case seems to say. And we don't even have to look specifically at the government situation. We can also look in day-to-day in -day private life. Does this mean that a religious adoption agency that declines to place children with same-sex couples is violating the rights that are now protected by Ober Obergefell? A religious college, for example, that provides married student housing, but because of their religious tenets, provides married, married student housing only to opposite gender marriages because same-sex marriages are in violation of their religion. Or even in purely private commercial businesses. Can someone who does not believe in same-sex marriages, who runs a business making wedding cakes, can they refuse to bake a cake, to 
honor uh, an order from a gay couple that wishes to get married? These are all questions that are still left open by the United States Supreme Court. And given the current political situation in the United States, your guess is as good as mine. And I thank you. Pardon? Oh, well, my, my very first example of will public officials be allowed to refuse to issue licenses, we've actually already had that situation. Um, several weeks after this decision was handed down, um, a clerk in a court, excuse me, a clerk in the marriage license office of a county in Kentucky who was a born again Christian and who was certain that if she had anything to do with a same sex marriage, she would be damned for eternity, she refused. She refused to issue a marriage license. She said, I can't put my name on something like that. The couple who had applied for the marriage license took her to court, sued the government, and said, Obergefell says we have this right, and she's violating our right. So the court said, if you don't issue the license, we will hold you in contempt of court. She refused, so the court sent her to jail. She went to jail for five days. And after a couple of days, the governor of the state of Kentucky, in order to avoid even greater scandal or greater problems, changed the law. He issued an executive order saying that from now on, city clerks, county clerks, no longer had to put their names on marriage licenses. So because of this change, the woman who'd been sent to jail said, well, okay, that I can do as long as my name isn't on it, and she dropped her suit. So we've already had an example of this. Who knows where this is going to go? Any questions? <laughs>